Welcome, everyone. I've been, the last several years, have been trying to understand infrared photography, finding it's a very technically oriented type of photography. And so I've decided tonight to present my, where I'm at, and to try to explain some of the basics behind infrared photography. To understand how to approach infrared photography, you have to have a basic idea of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I grabbed this uh, off on NASA website. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum, of course, covers everything from, you know, from the radio waves to the gamma waves. And the visible light is that tiny portion. It's 380 to 750 nanometers. Now, the par for infrared involves from 750 to 1400 nanometers. But for infrared photography, we're really only using the lower portion, the 750 to 1000 nanometers. And I bring up this one because even when we're with visible light, the filters that we use in infrared photography are all based on blocking various wavelengths of the visible light. Uh, the most common filters, and I'll be getting more into this later, the 720 nanometer blocks almost about half the red and everything else and just allows the infrared through. Whereas a 590 filter, which is the second most popular one, uh, as you tell from the chart, uh, leaves all the red and oranges and starts blocking from the yellows down all the way through violet. And of course, there's many more types of filters and ways to do that, which uh, I don't think we'll have time to get into tonight. A uh, little bit of a history. Um, if, like me, if you all were shooting film for years, I never did try to shoot infrared film, but it was the only, you had to use that plus filters. And I, the film had to be, it was only, of, uh, would only be, would only see certain portions of the infrared spectrum. Um, whereas now when we get into digital, the, the modern digital sensors uh, not only can see all visible light, but they also include the ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths, 350 nanometer to 1000 nanometer. And the way the camera companies basically fix this problem is put what they call a hot mirror filter in front of the sensor blocking all the unwanted wavelengths. Now, one nice thing about uh, digital photography is all digital, all digital cameras, including cell phones, actually can shoot infrared images. Even though they have that hot melt filter in front of them, still some infrared light can get through. And to, to, uh, to actually shoot infrared, like on a cell phone or a, on a, a regular camera, is just with a tripod and use long exposures. Okay, the, uh, the hot mirror plus an infrared filter can lead to, like I said, one or two minute exposures real easily. And I uh, guess, as I see on Zoom, part of my, uh, I have a 10 year old Olympus in this photo and a, a cat photo I found on an old iPhone. So I had to share it. Okay, back in October 2020, I attended a Zoom webinar by Rad Drew on infrared photography that he's doing on the iPhone. Um, he's a photography educator based in, in Indiana and believed in pushing the iPhone to its limits. And right now he has a current group of uh, 1,500 members on his Facebook group. Now, I started in, that, in 2020 shooting infrared photos with my iPhone 11. And what I used was uh, a moment case that um, that allowed a bayonet filter to be mounted on the can on the phone. Uh, I bought a 52 millimeter 720 nanometer filter and went off shooting. And that was this was my portable setup little tripod that I was using. And I ran, so once I got all the the filter and the mount, the lens, I mean, the, the special case for the iPhone 11, I started photographing. You may remember seeing these. Um, 
started at the, this is from the California uh, Canoe Valley Botanic Garden. If you remember the kids treehouse there, it seems like every time I have a new uh, toy to play with, I take pictures of the, around the Botanic Gardens, my testing site. So uh, this photo I always liked, but as you can see, it, we, I had to do it on a tripod as a six second exposure. Uh, this one was eight seconds, again, on a tripod. And this one got well, got a lot of uh, well-received feedback. Uh, Four-second exposure, ISO 6, I actually was using that mini tripod set right next on the ground, trying to see through the uh, back of the phone, trying to see what I was shooting. But... But the, uh, okay. Uh, during 2020, I was in 2021, early 2021, I was running around California, photographed several of the old missions and discovered that I enjoyed the uh, results with uh, infrared with the uh, the foliage. This is classic infrared where the anything that's alive, like foliage or plant material, uh, because of the uh, photosynthesis, in, in, in infrared, it turns white or really light color if you do color infrared. And everything else just goes a deep black. And that's why the dark skies. And in this one, I did a 30 second exposure to blur the clouds. And then I started trying to do some handheld stuff. And this is the fish rocks up by Ridgecrest. Um, 125th a second, and I was keep, even though the ISO got up to a thousand, I think my exposure was pretty straight on, and results on this was pretty good. So right after that, I left on a long road trip, <laughs> and because I was making several stops a day, I didn't have time to use a tripod, so I resorted to doing a lot of handheld photography, infrared photography, with my iPhone 11. And what happened was most of the results were poor. Um, at this uh, windmill ranch near Stockton, California, I, it was a good example. The, the sky is just full of grain. And this the problem was shooting through the, the equivalent of a hot filter and the iPhone plus the infrared 720 nanometer filter was uh, handheld. It just, uh, it, the images just fell apart. So that summer, I looked into converting an old Canon Rebel 3Ti, and I had it converted into a full-spectrum infrared camera. Now, this is when you know, I had to start doing a lot of research into infrared. There's a lot of material online, but I found that Rob Shea Photography and his, his uh, website and his videos and his training videos and his book are all pretty much the basis of what I do now with it by this with this camera. Now um, it costs around two fifty to four hundred dollars to convert a camera to infrared. Basically, all when a camera is converted, what they're doing is to removing the hot filter from in front of the sensor. Uh, but it pays to have someone who really knows what they're doing do it because they can also do some calibration. I use the Spencer's camera. And even though my camera was not on his recommended list, it was the only camera body I had available to convert. So I went ahead and did it. And I sent along the kit lens to have it uh, um, uh, adjusted to uh, the lens and filter as it did together. Now, some of the problems with uh, infrared photography is a lot of lenses and, and my cell phone photos also had this problem. It's called hot spots. There's, especially with the more modern lenses, the center area can be overexposed from the color shifting that usually results from uh, the infrared being bent slightly differently than regular color. Um, now, the, the way to check this out, you just you don't have to buy, you don't have to just use a lens and test it. There's lots of information in the infrared photography community on, on Rob Shear's website 
he has a list of lenses that do not have hot spots, and my lenses do not. So now another one, uh, another problem with infrared photography is, as you know, lenses are corrected for visible light. The diffraction of the infrared, because it's a different wavelength, uh, if it's not controlled properly, at, uh, especially you'll see it if you shoot an infrared photo at around f16 or f22, you'll have a lot of contrast lost and uh, detail loss. So to shoot infrared, you really need to use the middle the middle apertures like f5, 6, or f8. Now, also, when you do a camera conversion, you really have two options. You can re replace the hot filter with an infrared filter, like the 590 nanometer or 720 nanometer, or just remove the hot filter and use external filters. This is what I did. It's called a full spectrum conversion. OK, the infrared filters are. Uh, like I said, the two most common are the 590 and 720. The 590 infrared only blocks the orange and red light, only allows the orange and red light through. The 720 nanometer infrared filler blocks both red and all of the colors. And for the first couple of years, I was mostly using 720. One other thing is shoot raw. Um, if you want to shoot JPEG on an infrared camera, you also have to go through a step, step and insert a get a custom white balance within the camera. There's ways of doing it. And I went ahead and did that a couple of years ago with my camera. You, and then you use that custom white balance to when you shoot the photos. But with RAW, it's easier. Uh, unique profiles are, are added after in post-processing. Now, the other thing I found, it was kind of fun for a while for me, was there's for about $25, $35 on Amazon, there's several variable infrared filters that go from 530 to 750. And when I was when I travel, I try to I tried these a lot. Um, this 530, of course, I would set it around 580 or 590 and would give me a, a full uh, shutter speed of full aperture step faster. So I could shoot at like 125th. And if I change it to 720 without having to move to shoot a 720 version, I would just shoot at 60th of a second. Okay. But as uh, these are these type of filters are really not recommended because they can lead to blurring and uneven sky density. And that's uh, ruined quite a few of my photos. So I went back to just regular 720 filters. Now, uh, after I got my camera, I'd get out and test it, went to the Gardens of the World and had the classic infrared plant photo. I also was trying it uh, with that variable filter at the Winslow Camera Air Show. I always liked this image with the, uh, the gentleman with his uh, hat <laughs> and the color, blue colors or false colors. And here's a, an example of using that filter on the same subject. The Perkins Clairborg house at Heritage Square in Oxnard. I shot it this color version. And once I in post processing, which I'll get to in a few minutes, I, I added the false colors. Or at the, with the 720 setting, I just made a black and white of the same house. And this was the first color image that I really enjoyed working on. And I did a, a another version for this presentation tonight. It was on Route 66 uh, at an old motel with a bunch of photographers. It was a uh, workshop. And uh, there's this gentleman up in the Casadero. It has a, a large mansion. And in, in his yard, he's got a lot of fake dinosaurs. So I was like. And that would, and I always take the camera with me. And when I find a good opportunity to, in the middle of the day, that's the nice thing about infrared. You have to shoot it when there's sunlight out in the middle of the day. And 
Now, I was going to go to, in, in last September, I was going to go up to Oregon. And about a month before I was there, this uh, Shanko, Oregon, which is a, basically a ghost town um, with a few people living there running businesses, had this uh, accident that destroyed one of the main buildings in town. And I was there almost a month later, and uh, this uh, scene was still there. Um, so late in August, semi truck buried itself into the the restaurant. The truck destroyed the ice cream parlor and the antique business and the restaurant. Um, I wanted to share this infrared photo because it also showed the tire tracks left by the uh, truck accident, or maybe the tow truck removing the truck. <laughs> so even though it was like four weeks later, <laughs> the tread tread marks are still there. And then in February of 2022, I went to the Missile Park, which is what one of my places to go to to try out camera gear and test things. Um, so this was shot with, the, again, the, the 720 nanometer filter. And I was basically staying around F7.1 or F5.6 when I've been using this camera. And this, this works out pretty well. So for this, uh, for processing black and white, I was, uh, the next several, I'm going to be discussing, how, showing how I post-process the F4 Phantom. Okay, before pro processing, you have to install in Lightroom. You can either do it with software, make your own profiles. I just went ahead and purchased uh, two free camera profiles and related profiles from Rob Shearer and loaded it into my Lightroom. Okay. In the profile browser, find the group name profiles, select the color profiles, which case it will be the camera model with temp minus 15 and temp minus 100, there's two. And you load those into the uh, system. Now, when you go to work on your photo, select the neutral or gray Okay, okay, back up a minute. When you're working on a photo, you select either the temp 50 or the temp 100. Now, they basically say that if you use a 720 nanometer filter, you're best off using the minus 50 profile. If you're using the 590, you're best off to try to start using the minus 100 profile. And then after you've selected the profile, you then use the, the picker to select a neutral, something to select to give you the white balance. Now, when you do your white balance on the Calvin scale on Lightroom, if it falls between 2,000 and 50,000, uh, you have a suitable white balance. But if the color temperature maxes out at one extreme, like 2,000 or 50,000, uh, then you try the other profile. So this is the original raw photo that I got the, in Lightroom Classic. After When you shoot infrared, when you open up the files, they're going to have a really bluish cast or more commonly a red cast. And so I went ahead and did my first crop. Now, I was here, I uh, applied the minus 50 camera filter. And I did the white balance on the tree trunk, which turned it pretty much straight into black and white. And then I did my final adjustments to increase the contrast and uh, various things. And uh, lightened it up a little bit and had a tighter crop for my final image. Now, um, for color infrared, you do the same basic steps with the addition of a color channel swapping. And there's lots of ways of doing this. And back to that Route 66 hotel in Texas, I shot the original around 590 nanometers with that variable infrared filter. And I reprocessed this about a week ago for the, for the program tonight. 
I picked a fit minus 50 camera profile applied. So I'm going to go back just for the comparison. That's the original. And that's after you apply the profile, you can see the changes in colors, moves a lot of the uh, color cast. And this time I did the white, the color picker on the sunlit area on the lower left on the pavement to give it the white balance. And of course it turned the foliage into a nice blue. And I like the 16 by nine ratio now, I'm using that a lot more. And now I will use the minus 50 hue profile. Basically it's a channel swap profile, turn the blue plants into a pink. And then final adjustments, you know, is increasing contrast and increasing saturation and clean up the image a little bit. And this is the version I came up for tonight's show. And I can compare that against the one I did in 2021, what it's actually had done in Photoshop with channel swaps. Now, this is a, a couple of images that I just did in the last couple of months. Um, I'm trying to do more. I, I got a new set of infrared filters at Christmas as, as a Christmas present. So I've been playing with the uh, 720ME filters. These filters are a lot on the same camera. The images are definitely sharper. Okay. Um, this was at the Botanic Gardens again, where I go to test it, test something new. And this one, I think, was in the contest last month. Uh, the Yanks Air Museum in Chino. Now I uh, went into color Lightroom color grading because uh, of one of the people I follow. I found out her work, her whole work, which I'll add at the end, um, just to see how she was doing it. This is a 720 nanometer black and white. Orig the original is uh, uh, now a monochrome. And with the color grading, I gave it the, the brownish green tint. And this one uh, with the 720 nanometer filter, you still have that colors left. And so with channel swaps, I got the, the blue trees and added to this photo from Ransburg. Now, um, to wrap things up, um, these are the uh, resources I have. Uh, Rod Photography, Rod his Facebook page, uh, Rob Shi, and his camera packs. Now, I've been following Piper McKay. She's based in Africa, does a lot of photography. And I recently really found out that she has been doing these black and white uh, with the, uh, not sepia tone, but a brown tone, black and whites for years. And I feel like I've recently found out that she's actually making infrared with 720 nanometers and then toning them afterwards. So that's why I've been looking at her work more and recommend that's a good place to start looking at how you can work with developing your own style. Um, the Facebook infrared uh, in you know, ultraviolet photography group, is, I've seen a lot of really beautiful images on that group just in the last couple of weeks. And then with the new Dune Part 2 movie, their Pixel, PETA Pixel had this really nice, interesting article about how to do their copy their infrared effects. And it, it has an in-depth article. It also talks a lot about uses of various infrared filters, okay? Back in 2022, two years ago, I did a series of infrared photos at the old city hall, okay? And I pulled it, I shot it all with that variable infrared filter. And I pulled this one out because it gives a good idea what the effects are up in the skies. It, a lot of times it is like, it can be like a polarizer. It's very uneven in the skies, okay? Now, this one, uh, 
the the ones that went blue were shot with 720 nanometer and i'm gonna have to hide the people here i pulled these up to, to uh, go back through the whole process again now as you can see the um the filters to, uh, these are the filters for based on my camera and they actually don't look like they're doing very much but uh i still click on it and that's the uh, temp that that's the filter that's assigned to my camera it's a camera filter or a camera profile excuse me okay the next step is uh go and use the you want to set a white point and of course the building was pretty white so that gives me the uh the, the white balance I just pick on a spot and now you can see that the uh black and white is uh the the histogram is pretty bunched up now if i hit black and white it opens it up a little bit but then i can go ahead and set the white point and if i use the option use that and now it's brightened it up quite a bit and bring back the blacks. And now it's really contrasting. So I have to open up the shadows and the darken the highlights. But that's kind of like the battles that you're facing with when you're working on infrared. Pick another one here. Again, I'm going to. Pick the profile. I'm using the minus 50. Who's that? And there's lots of ways of doing it. You can this time I'm going to try to actually set the whites a little bit before I even do the gray. Again, even after I did the gray, I mean to set the whites, when I did the white balance, it closed it up quite a bit. And if I hit the black and white it really popped the highlights, but because it's already monochrome, you can also do things like darkening highlights, but you can um, you know, this one is when, they, when you start using the mass. So I'd go in here, cut the brush, I actually want to keep the sky dark, so open up that. Put that backwards. Yeah, I'm just doing this real quick. There it goes. As you can see, there's a lot of post processing that goes into doing these, get them to come out the way you want. And let's see, I'll go back to this color one. Um, this thing. And this time, it uh, I'm going to pick the other one. But I'm, I'm leaving this up there because um, you can do a wall white point. There it goes. Now, because this one's in color, down here it shows I was using the minus 100. It gives me the various color options that I can pick to do the false color. And that's basically just a very simple overview of how I work in Lightroom.